take out our Bibles. And we begin this morning in 1 John. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, chapter 5. I do want to talk this morning about, uh, well, you saw it, you probably saw in the bulletin, the causes and the reasons why people have doubts if they're saved or not. Why people have doubts. And a lot of, a lot of times they should have doubts, because sometimes people aren't saved, and they need, they need to get saved. That'll remove their doubts. That's one of them. And we'll start this, this morning in 1 John chapter 5. Yeah, 1 John chapter 5. The things we can know. K-N-O-W. That's a good word. That's an important word. 1 John chapter 5. And we'll be reading here in beginning verse 10. 1 John chapter 5 verse 10. Let me introduce the uh, message this morning this way. First of all, there are times when people have doubts about their salvation, if they're really saved or not. Now, there could be, there's a, basically two different reasons for that. One, our first, uh, they are saved, and they need to grow in faith. Or secondly, they're not saved, because they, they, they have doubts about their salvation, because they're not saved, they're not saved. So when people talk to you or me about, are they saved, saved? are they born again, uh, there's reasons for those doubts, there's reasons for those thoughts, and again, it's could be because they need to get saved to begin with. That's one of the difficult things, isn't it? Trying to get people convinced that they're not saved. There's times when I talk to people who think they are saved, and can I say this this way? I know they're not. Let me say that. Say, Pastor, are you judging people? Yeah. Yeah. Supposed to judge people, examine people. People are supposed to examine themselves. If they won't examine themselves, then I'll examine them for themselves. Does that fit? It's biblical. Uh, he that is spiritual judges all things. Judgeth all things. Yes. He that is spiritual, if you're not judging things, you're not spiritual. That's what the Bible says. So if you talk to people, and one of the hardest things is to get them lost. Yep. You know, that's an old saying. Yep. Before you get them saved, you have to get them lost. And really that conviction, that, that sense of uh, that they're being lost, really is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. You need, you need to pray for them. Pray that the Holy Spirit of God will show them their, their real spiritual condition, that they're not saved. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God can dig through all those things and show them what, that they're not saved. They need that. But some can be really saved and have some doubts. That's true. There's a reason for that. We're going to talk about eight different reasons why, eight different things involved in this, this situation, causes, causes for doubts. And maybe I should put it this way too. Causes that people should have doubts. People that don't have doubts and should have doubts. That's a good way to say it too. First John chapter 5, beginning verse 10 here, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in, in himself, it's a good place for, for uh, assurance in themselves. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. They don't believe what the Bible say about salvation in the sense they're not believing God because saying that God lied about it. That's a powerful accusation, isn't it? Because, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. Because people don't believe the record of what? God's son. Jesus Christ. Verse 11. And this is the record. Here it is. That God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is where? In His Son. Point number seven this morning, if I get to it, which I'm pretty sure I will. It talks about people that want to have salvation, but they don't want Jesus Christ. They want salvation, but they don't want Jesus Christ. They don't realize or understand. Sometimes they willingly don't understand. Sometimes they ignorantly don't understand that you can't have salvation unless you first receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You understand what that means to so submit to that. So through Jesus Christ. But here it is. This life is in his, in his Son, in Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus Christ, you have the life. You have eternal life. Now verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. 
See, people want salvation, but they don't want Jesus Christ. They don't want the Son. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you, written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, K-N-O-W, here's something you can know for sure, know that ye have, present tense, have eternal life right now. You don't get eternal life when you die. It's too late then. If you don't have it at that point, it's too late then. Eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence. There it is. Confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth it. And if we know that we hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire getting into uh, answered prayer here. So let's pray before we start the message this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help me to have clarity of thought and words this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all the ones that are here, because they wanted to be here, to honor you. They honor you by being here in your house. And may they have come with open heart and open mind to, to hear these things and to receive these things and to learn some things today and be blessed by them, maybe convicted by them. But Lord, just help me as I preach this morning. Please bless, guide, and direct by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name and for his sake, I pray and ask it. Amen. Yes. Amen. Causes of doubts. Why people doubt their salvation? Why they doubt certain things? And what to look for? Because it is difficult. People don't want to uh, really listen a lot of times. And what to look for to recognize if they are really saved or they're not saved, to examine themselves and he that is spiritual uh, judgeth all things. Here's the first one. The most obvious one is in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9. Will be there. In fact, no, I want to turn somewhere else. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Let's turn there first. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it's a well-known verse in our church, one of the most well-known verses, probably. But the first thing that people have, when, uh, one of the first things you need to look for if people are doubting their salvation, or if people should be doubting their salvation. But many times when people ask me, Pastor, do you think I'm saved? Do you think I'm a Christian? It shows they've got some questions and some wonderings. And again, like I said before, let me repeat it again. Uh, even Christians can have doubts. It doesn't mean they're not saved if they have doubts. But it could be that they're not saved. But they're looking for some kind of experience, some kind of emotionalism. In, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says here, So then faith, faith, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now what's the opposite of faith? Not knowing. No, no, no. Doubt. Doubt. If you have faith, you don't have doubts. If you have doubts, you don't have faith. So if you have doubts, what do you need then? Faith. And if you, you need faith, where do you get faith? So then faith cometh by hearing, Hearing by the Word of God. Hearing by the Word of God. Some places, some people think you have to feel it. Now, I'm glad that feelings go along with salvation many times. I'm glad that I feel good about being saved. I'm glad that's a part of it. I come to church and I feel good about coming to church. And I feel good about singing the songs. But I, I notice how, how you can change your emotions, can't you? Right. Emotions are very flexible, very changeable. You can change your emotions by what you process in your mind, what you're thinking. Change what you're thinking, and you can change your emotions. Emotions are very flexible. That They're changeable, aren't they? But we need to base our salvation and assurance of salvation on something different than emotions. Because emotions will not lead you the right way. There's times you feel safe. There's times you'll feel good about it. There's times you maybe won't feel all that safe. Here's a good little paragraph I, I found that I, I'd like to read here. So Romans 10, 17 again, faith going by what? Hearing. Hearing by the word of God. If you have doubts, you, you don't have faith. Uh, so you need faith. And how do you get faith then? Do you really have doubts? The word of God. Here's one man's thought on it, and I thought it was good. It talks about the human side of faith. The human side of faith. On the human side of faith, it's produced by the, the Word of God. The Word of God. The Scriptures dis disclose our need. The Scriptures state the promises, promises of God. 
They indicate the conditions. There are conditions to salvation. Yeah. People say it's free, but there's conditions of salvation. What does the Bible say to get saved? You have to believe. That's a condition. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's a condition to salvation. There are conditions of salvation. You have to believe. And what's involved in believing? That's not this morning's message, but that's important. You have to believe to be saved. That's a condition of salvation. The scriptures disclose our need, state the promises of God, indicate the conditions, and point out the blessings of salvation. Now, this next statement is very strong, very clear. Salvation begins with an intellectual belief in the Word of God. Let me say that again. Salvation begins with an intellectual belief in the Word of God. Amen. You have to read the Bible. Amen. Don't try to feel it. Don't try to have emotional experiences. And, and, and that's what you're going to base your salvation on. You have to have an intellectual understanding of what the Bible says about salvation. It's the Word of God, the Word of God. But people are looking for experiences. They're looking for a feeling. That's why you go in some churches, they get all excited. They get the people all worked up, you know. They get all people worked up with the music. Uh, it seems like some churches, it has to be loud. If it's not loud, it's not good. I mean, everybody's got to be yelling and screaming and calling out. The preacher's got to scream and yell. And there's nothing wrong with a loud preaching sometimes. Uh, that's all right in this place. But you have to be careful of that. It's just not emotionalism. You have to base your faith on what the Bible says. Because the emotions, they change all the time. My emotions have changed 18 times just this morning already. From the time I woke up this morning to the night I'm preaching right here, my emotions have changed about 18 times already. That's not a good thing. That's not something I want to base my life on. And that's certainly not something I want to base my salvation on. Not on my emotions. I, I feel it at times. I'm glad I can feel it and have a joy of the Lord at times. But based on intellectual understanding of the Word of God and believing what it says. Let the emotions be the caboose on the train, not the engine. Not the engine. So number one, when people are doubting their salvation, try to sense, are they just uh, basing their salvation on some kind of feeling? they got to feel it. So they go to churches that are highly emotional. I think churches ought to have a joy in their, in their services. I think they ought to have a certain amount of emotion, but not out of control. Church services don't have to be loud. Watch out, listen to this one. Church, church services don't need drums. Amen. When drums come in, spiritual, spirituality goes out. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. That's just... The Bible talks nothing about drums. It talks about other musical instruments, but not drums in the Bible at all. But anyways, emotionalism. Some churches, they, they deal on emotions. God get people all worked up. They do that with the music. They do it with the drums. They do it with the loud preaching. And we need to have some loud preaching at times. That's all right. But be careful. Are they basing their salvation and their assurance and their confidence on emotionalism? Some kind of emotion. Beware of that. Sense that. Determine that in the person you're talking to. Why are they doubting their salvation? Are they just trying to feel it in some way, and emotionally in some way? That's a problem. And that's not the Bible way. The Bible is get them in the Word of God. People are so, I might say this one point all morning long here. People are lazy in different ways. There's different types of laziness. There's physical laziness. When he got up this morning, he probably felt like I did. I didn't want to get up. Pastor, you didn't want to get up out of bed. I never want to get up out of bed in the morning. But I'm here. I made myself. That's a physical kind of laziness. But there's an intellectual type of laziness. People don't want to read. Even the Bible. Uh, we have a wonderful book table out there in the hallway uh, with all kinds of different subjects, all kinds of things people can read. Read. Get a book today. Read it this, in the next few weeks or so. Make yourself read. Don't be intellectually lazy. Don't be intellectually lazy about reading the Bible, the Word of God. So number one, when people have doubts, look for that. Are they just trusting some kind of feeling? 
Rather than trusting real biblical faith through the Word of God, intellectually reading it, understanding what it says, and then believing what it says, and then the emotions are the caboose on the train. Number two, another problem here, this, now we're to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Look for, they're looking, look for a works-based salvation. Works-based, different works that people do that they think they're, they're saved because of their different works. And the things that, first things that come to mind is when you ask people if they're saved, they'll talk about their baptism. And I'm really finding out that people today, I think, this is my thought on it, that people think as long as they're a church member, that they'll, you know, they're all right with God. And they're going to heaven. So just by being a church member, oh my. You know, church membership, a lot of these churches in the, in the past, maybe even today, I'm sure today too, there's, there's a, a minority of church members that are really saved. I, I've heard this quote. It said, the revivals they've had in the past, we're talking you know, a few hundred years ago, the revivals they had in the past, they started by church members getting saved. That's what started the revivals. When church members, those who are already members of churches, started getting saved. Church members getting saved. That's what brought the revival. That's what started the revivals. Ephesians chapter 2, we know very uh, very clearly here, it's not by works that we've done. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and the gift there is salvation. Not of works. There it is. A lot of people are trusting their works, something they do. What are works? Works is some good work that you do, uh, thinking that will get you saved, or make you right in God's sight, or get you to heaven someday. It's not a work, though. So. Lest any man should boast. Now, uh, now it talks in verse 10, it goes out and about explaining about it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So there's two places for works here. Two places for good works. Number, verse number 8, verse number 9, you're not saved by works. But once you are saved, you know, God wants you to do good works. Once you're saved, not to get saved, not to stay saved, but because you are a Christian now, and we're saved unto good works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto works, good works. The difference there is important. But people today, it surprises me, even Baptists. I remember one specific illustration, this took place years and years and years ago. Sad to say by a person that came to our church, and it was an older person. They were, in fact, in their 90s already. And I asked them once, I said, well, when did you get saved? I was visiting in their house, and I asked them, well, when did you get saved? And their answer shocked me. If they could see my thoughts at they, that time, they'd see how shocked I was. And they said, now what's my question again? When did you get saved? I was expecting, you know, as a young person, I heard the gospel or a teenager or something. And I went forward, and, you know, she, uh, this person said, well, I was baptized on, and they told me when they were baptized. And I, inside, I was shaking my head. I'm thinking, no, oh, that's not salvation. Doesn't this person know that? Doesn't this Baptist person know that? Doesn't this Baptist person that has been coming to our church for years know that? That baptism has nothing to do with salvation. You can be baptized and not be saved. You can baptize over and over again and not go to heaven. Baptism is not salvation. Uh, church membership is not salvation. Acting like a Christian is not salvation. You have to be saved first, you have to be born again first, and then the change will be automatic in a sense, natural, because now you have a new nature you never had before, because then now God is working in your life, inside you like he never did before. There's going to be a change. Behold, look at the changes that take place. Not based on works, though. Not on works. They're trusting their good works. They're trusting their baptism. They're trusting their church membership. They're trusting that they're not all that bad a sinner. They're better than a lot of people. They're trusting the wrong thing. Even Baptists. I can believe that for Catholics. I can believe it for Lutherans. I heard that out of the Lutheran pastor's mouth. And this person what, what, is in heaven today because they, well, they passed away. This person is in heaven today because they were baptized as a baby. 
And I'm thinking, I can't believe what I'm hearing. This is one of my family funerals I went to a little ways from here. I went to another, they had a Lutheran minister doing the service. This person is heaven today because they were baptized as a baby, because their parents baptized them. They are in heaven today because of that. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I hear people talking about that. I hear about, about people that believe that. But for my own ears to hear that, uh, right there sitting in that funeral service, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They're in heaven today because their parents baptized them as a baby. No, that's good works. That's works. Are they really born again? Have they been changed by the Spirit of God? That's why people don't have assurance today. Because they're trusting the wrong thing. Some good work. Some good work. Our job is to make them unsaved. To show they're not saved. They're not born again. What's another thing to look for when people are asking about it and they have uncertainty about their salvation? Look for willing disobedience. Turn to John chapter 5. Gospel John. And we'll look at a couple of Get a couple thoughts here that cover John chapter 5, beginning verse 39. Looking for, look for willing disobedience. See, some people will do some things that are right. They'll do some things. But other things, they'll, they don't want to do certain things. They'll do something. They'll come out to church. But that's as far as it goes. They'll, they'll do some other things. But you know something? People know more than they're doing. People know that they should be doing more than they are, and they refuse to do that. People are just stubborn. Stubborn. How stubborn are people? Well, how stubborn are we in our ways? Self-centered, stubborn. John chapter 5, verse 39. Here's a big problem. The Lord talking here in John chapter 5, and verse number 39, beginning verse 39. The Lord says here, search the scriptures. Now, that's a good answer. One, two, three words. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Again, the Lord speaking here. Now, here's verse 4 that deals with this point. And ye, ye will not come to me that ye might have life, eternal life, that means. Ye will not. They're being stubborn. They're saying, no, they're saying, no look, Jesus Christ here. They're saying no to God. By saying no to Jesus Christ, they're saying no to God. Willing disobedience. People are stubborn. They don't want to do something. They might even make excuses for it, but they're stubborn in what they will not do. I'll do this, I'll do that, but I'm not going to do that. I'll not do that. They're stubborn. And friends, are you stubborn? I know the answer to that. I know the answer to you, everyone in this room, excluding myself, no, <laughs> including myself. Are we stubborn? naturally stubborn people. If you don't say yes, you're lying. <laughs> if you don't say yes, you're being stubborn about answering my question this morning. Yes, we're all stubborn. We have that stubbornness. That's one of the things we have to break through and we have to get over and improve in that area, not to be so stubborn, to be unselfish, be other-centered, and not self-willed, not stubborn about things, but stubborn, stubborn. It keeps people from getting saved. You know, you invite your family member out, people that you know on the job, maybe other people like, that you know in the neighborhood and so forth. You invite them out to church and you're after them and you, you can sense them, can't you? sense them getting stubborn. You invite them out, give them a track, and you can sense their, no, that's all right. You know, the first time, oh, no, that, that's all right. Thank you, though, for asking. Then you ask them again, say, no, no, I'm not interested. Ask them a third time. Ask them that fourth time. See what their attitude is. Don't they get more and more stubborn? They can, you can drive a person to the point where they become angry right. just by inviting them out to church, just by trying to get them to believe in the Lord. And you can, you can keep after them. By, by the way, use your sense about this too. If they're getting up stubborn about it, just back off. Let the Lord work in their heart. You, by the way, Christian, you've said more than you think you said. Uh, just by one time, even one time, that's going to be in their mind. That's going to work its way into their hearts. Uh, even speaking one time, if you find getting more and more stubborn about things, just back off. That's all right. Give them time. Pray for them. But boy, they get stubborn, don't they? We all have that stubbornness, that disobedience. Hear the Lord said, you will not come unto me. That you might have. You will not. What, that's, what he's saying there is, they're just stubborn. Stubborn. Why? 
Well, we're going to talk about that. There are other things coming up that I think will answer that question too. But look for willing disobedience. Where are they being stubborn? I mean, they'll say, oh, I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus. But you don't have to go to church, you know, to be a Christian. Wherever they say no, that's where they have to repent in. And we're going to talk about repentance here. But point number three, cause for doubt because they're disobedient in some area. In some area of their life, they're being disobedient. They're not being obedient to the Lord. In some area, they don't know they need to be obedient in. Point number four, what's another area uh, that causes for doubt? When they look for an easy Christianity, easy. They want a shortcut to heaven. They say, I don't, uh, what they're really saying is, I want to sneak in the back door some way. But I want an easy Christianity. I don't want all that difficult. I don't want it to be that hard. I don't want to surrender all. Surrender all. I believe that's our invitation song this morning. Uh, I surrender all. They want to surrender all. They want to surrender part time. Part of it. A little bit of it. Luke chapter 14 verse 33 says you need to surrender all. You need to submit everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will, you're going to be born again. And you'll not regret surrendering all. You'll not regret that. But people want an easy Christianity. It's too much trouble. Too much trouble to get up on a Sunday morning and go to church. It's too much trouble to do what the Bible says. Too much trouble. That's what people are really thinking. They don't want to be bothered with Christianity. Bothered with Christianity. They don't want to be bothered with heaven. They don't want to be bothered with a, their, their eternal existence, where it's going to be. They don't want to be bothered where they're going to be for the rest of their eternity. They don't want to be bothered by those things. They don't want to be troubled by those things. How, how, how crazy, how, oh boy, I said it, did that. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? They don't want to be bothered with Christianity. They don't want to be bothered with Jesus Christ. They don't want to be bothered with the Bible. They don't want to be bothered with these. It's too much trouble. Well, they won't be thinking that on years from now, will they? We need to bother people, but we need to be careful too. When you send them getting more and more stubborn, just like I say, back off. You said something, it'll be remembered. Believe me, it'll be remembered. The Holy Spirit of God will use that. But boy, people, 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 they want an easy Christianity. What's the least I have to do to get saved? You know what the answer to that and question is? Everything. You have to believe everything. You have to surrender everything. I surrender all. That's what it takes to really be saved. And those that have made that decision are not sorry they did. Are we Christians? We're not sorry we surrender all to Jesus Christ. Number five, what's another reason that cause for doubt? Uh, look for re reluctance making a public confession. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10. This is one of those verses I memorized in my very, very young Christian life. Romans chapter 10, verse, beginning verse 9. They don't want to make a public confession. Christianity is an embarrassment to man's pride. Amen. To witness about the Lord, you have to fight through that pride. There's something that, Chris, isn't there something in your life? I was brought up recently in one of the messages too. That when you want to do something for the Lord, you want to witness somebody, talk to somebody, there's something inside of you uh, that's uh, hindering you from doing that. There's something inside you say, don't do that, don't do that. That's going to be difficult. Don't do that. That's going to be kind of embarrassing. Isn't there something that kind of trying to hold you back? Now, what should you do? You yeah. need to get the victory there. Really? You need to ignore that. Go on anyway. Fight the battle anyway. Witness to that person anyway. Give out that track anyway. But what is it that, that, that comes up when you say, I'm going to witness to that person. I'm going to talk to that person about the Lord. I'm, I'm going to give them a track. What is it inside of us that uh, is kind of holding us back from doing that? What is that? That's our pride. That's our pride. Please, Christian, recognize what the spiritual battle really is. That's the battle. Fighting and going against the old nature there. So look for that reluctance in making a public confession. It is embarrassing to people to recognize that they would be a Christian, what, how they have to change their life. First thing they think about, well, not me, first thing, one of the things they think about is, boy, my old friends would probably laugh about me. Yeah. You know, when my old friends got together and they found that I became a Christian, my old friends would probably get together and hey, but you know, you know what happened to them? 
They got, he, they got him converted. They got him going to church or her going to church. They laugh about you. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because they're not Christians. They're not Christians. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 again now, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So what does it take? A confession with the mouth. A public confession telling people, you're a Christian, you're going to be a Christian, you are a Christian. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, mouth, confession is made unto salvation, with the mouth. Listen to what people are saying. Watch what people are doing. So people are embarrassed about Christians. They're embarrassed if you even talk to them about the Lord. You want to give them a track or something, they're embarrassed about that. What is that? What is that embarrassment? Where, where does that come from? It comes from our pride. And we still have, even Christians still have that old nature, don't we? Now, where does that embarrassment come from? It comes from the pride. We don't want to be, I don't want anybody making fun of us, laughing at us. If we're a Christian, they're going to talk about, yeah, they got you converted, you know. They got you converted now. Make a joke out of you. That's hard to take, but what is it, what part of us is it hard to take about? Our pride. That's all it is, right? Fight through that pride, Christian, to witness to people. Lost person, you're going to get saved. You have to fight through that pride to get saved. You have to fight that pride. I'm going to put aside my pride. I put aside those things that embarrass me. I need Jesus Christ. I know I need Jesus Christ. I know I need to get saved. I want to go to heaven someday. Jesus died for me. Jesus loves me more than anyone in this world loves me. How can I turn that down? I'm not going to let my pride keep me from salvation. I'm not going to let my pride keep me from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God Almighty. He loves me. He died for me. I'm not going to let my pride keep me from Him. Amen. And all the people said, yeah, amen. amen. My pride. Don't let your pride drag you to hell. Could I say it any clearer than that? Fight through that pride. You're going to have it. It's going to come up. It's going to be there. Even as Christians, we still have the old nature. It's still going to be there. Christianity is an embarrassment to man's pride. Yes, it is. Look at what it did to Peter. Look at what it did to the apostle Peter. He denied the Lord what? Three times. Why? Why? Because a couple of little maids come. You're one of them. You're one of them. And he, with an oath. <laughs> oh, I think about it. He cursed. That's what I mean. He cursed. Pride drove him to the place where he denied the Lord with an oath. Pride did that. Being embarrassed because Jesus was going to be crucified. Jesus was in a weak point, not a weak point, but in that position then there. And Peter's pride defeated him. Peter's pride embarrassed him. And he denied the Lord with an oath. That pride, that pride. Reluctance to make a public confession, because it might, you might be laughed at, yeah. But another six, point six, what's another one? It causes for doubts. Look for an absence of repentance. We love that word in our church. A lot of churches you won't even hear it, but we love it in our church. Ezekiel, let's go back to the Old Testament. Yeah, it's Old Testament too. It's New Testament, it's Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6. Ezekiel 14, verse 6. The importance of repentance. And I have another thing I'm going to read this morning. I thought this is so good too about repentance. The importance of repentance. The importance of repentance is not always recognized in our day as it should be recognized. Oh, it sure is. Evangelists call upon the unsaved to accept Christ and to believe without ever showing the sinner that he is lost and needs a Savior. But the scriptures lay much stress on the preaching of repentance. Repentance was a message of the Old Testament prophets. We're going to read here in just a minute. It was the keynote preaching of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. John the Baptist, of the twelve as such, and in particular of Peter on the day of Pentecost, repent and believe. It was also fundamental in the preaching of Paul. The dispensational change, meaning the church age now, this is going from Old Testament to New Testament, the dispensational change has not made repentance unnecessary in our day. It is definitely a command to all men. Acts 17, verse 30. Repentance 
is something in which all heaven is supremely interested. It is the fundamental of fundamentals because it is an absolute condition to salvation. An absolute condition to salvation. That's not me saying this. This is Henry C. Thiessen from my, uh, my theology books. Uh, it is a fun, the fundamental of fundamentals because it is an absolute condition to salvation. And Jesus answering said unto them, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Perish. Look for an absence of repentance. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6 says this. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols. Idols are anything that you love more than the Lord. And turn away your faces from all your abominations. Idols are the abominations. That's not a good thing. For every one of the house of Israel, of the stranger that sojourneth in the land. By the way, look at the verse 7. For everyone in the house of Israel, there's two groups of people here. The house of Israel, what's the second group? Goes out and says the second group, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel. That means like we'd say to the Gentiles. Two groups need to repent, which separated himself from me and set up his idols in his heart, in his heart, and put at the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and come unto a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. It goes on to talk about that. Repent is repent. Chapter 18, verse 30. One more verse. Still in Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 30. Chapter 18, verse 30 says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone, everyone, according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent. And turn yourselves from all your transgressions. There's a false definition of repentance today that's a limited definition it's not a full bible definition it says you just repent of unbelief well yeah you need to repent of unbelief but here it talks about transgressions sins you need to repent of your sins you need to repent of unbelief yeah but you need to repent of your sins too can you repent of unbelief well there's a lot of people that believe believe the right things but that they want to keep on sinning too that's not bible salvation and that's why people have doubts. That's why, why they doubt their salvation. That's why they're not faithful in reading the Bible. That's why they're not faithful to come out of the church even. Because they have repented of their sins and turned yourselves from your transgressions. So iniquity. Now, notice the last part of this verse. Very interesting. Why God says it too. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Sin ruins people. Sin destroys people. God does not want to see you destroyed. He wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He wants to give you all kinds of good things. But, but you have to turn from the things that are destroying you. You have to repent of those things. Don't believe those things. Don't believe the liars. Don't believe the deceivers. Don't believe the false gospels today. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Make a public confession. Turn in your repentance from the sins in your life. And the other thing is, you don't have to tell people what their sins are. They know what they are. People that drink, they know they shouldn't be drinking. People that have a foul mouth, they know they shouldn't be, shouldn't have a foul mouth. They shouldn't be saying those nasty, ugly words. They know that. You don't even have to tell them what their sins are. They know they, they, what their sins are. Uh, they're convicted about them already. They're aware of them already. So you don't have to go around saying, you need to do that. Your sin is, you know, maybe at times you need to bring out something and deal with it. But I'm saying they already know they're sinners. They already, already know what their sins are. They need to repent. They need to turn from the sins they already know they're doing. If they'll turn from the sins they know they're doing, God will forgive them for all their sins. But something's the issue. The rich young ruler, what was his issue? It was money. And the Lord said, if you want to be saved, so to speak, if you want to be saved, sell everything you have, give away all your money. Come follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. The Lord God and the Holy Spirit of God today points out exactly what they need to repent of. Points out where, where they're saying no to God. 
But they're saying no to God. That's what they need to change. Why people don't have, why people have doubts, why they don't have certain, because there's an absence of repentance. They believe the things, but they don't want to turn from the sin in their, their everyday, their lives. They want to believe, but not repent. They want to have salvation, but they want to continue their sinfulness too. God doesn't accept that. And then the last thought this morning, why people have doubts, because they're looking for salvation of salvation, but they don't realize it's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in John 14, 6. Back to 1 John chapter 5 now, where we started. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to go back now. They need to, to believe and understand it's accepting Jesus Christ. Now, will Jesus accept him? Does Jesus accept your pen, you shall likewise perish. It's through Jesus Christ. Will Jesus Christ accept you? If you... Well, let's just read it. First John chapter 5, verse number 11 again. And this is a record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Again, First John chapter 5, now verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that not the Son of God hath not life. Through Jesus Christ. Is He your Lord? Is He your Savior? Is He your redemption? If you believe on him as Lord and Savior, you have to understand, you go to heaven by having Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is the way. The way to heaven is a person. Person. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why do people doubt their salvation? Why is it hard to, to convince people that they're not saved sometimes? But when you can see it, and they, a lot of times, they know it. They're not obeying the Lord. They know they're really not saved. Why is it hard to deal with them and, deal with, and show them they're not saved? Because they want their life. They're being stubborn about it. They're being self-willed about it. But they need Jesus Christ. And that pride, it's just there, isn't it? It's just there. Even after you're saved, that pride is still there. Say, no, don't pass out those tracks. Or don't witness that person. Or don't tell people you go to church. Don't tell people you're a Christian. That pride is there, wanting you to step back and not be the witness that the Lord wants you to be. And it's going to be there. It's going to be there. Fight it. And be the victor, not the victim. Yeah. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer this morning, Lord, as we deal with this issue of why, why people have doubts, Lord, again, it could be because they really are saved, but other things have come up, and they don't understand something, maybe doctrinally or something in their life, or maybe some sin has come up, and they have doubts because of that, and they should have those doubts. Sin destroys assurance of salvation. Or maybe they're not saved. Lord, there's so many people claiming to be saved but are not saved. Yeah. Not saved. I pray, Lord, that you work on their hearts, too. So bless now, Lord, as we consider these matters as we have this now, this special time, this prayer time, time of invitation, when we give people opportunity to pray about these matters. Even to come forward here and kneel down before you, as, as before you, as, as what really is what they are doing. It's like they're kneeling down before you, Lord, and humbling themselves before you. As we see so many New Testament illustrations of that happening. People coming up to the Lord, kneeling down before him and praying, asking for things. That's what the invitation is. Maybe it's for someone to believe on the Lord today, too, for real salvation. Uh, that would be so wonderful. So bless now this special time, this important time, too. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.